Hello, my name is Andrew Collins and I'm a telly addict. Well. I will teach you the way of tears and love, my friend. Now let's get out of this fucking cup before Ben Swain comes in for his lunchtime wank. A good thing. Anyway, to more immediate matters. It's been a week since the final episode of The Returned on Channel 4. I'm assuming we've all seen it now and it's okay for me to talk freely about how it ended. I was disappointed. I mean, how is anybody supposed to read two columns of credits when they're that small? As for what actually happened in the show, after eight weeks of subtitled alpine unease and a radical French reinterpretation of zombie lore, we hardened viewers expected some answers as we emerged blinking into a new dawn. How had Pierre known to gather all the principal cast, not including the serial killer Serge, inside the Helping Hand drop-in centre on the night it all went off? More pressingly, why had the return returned? Why were they all so hungry? Why was Victor called Louis and why had Pierre been in his bedroom 30 years ago when he weed himself in a wardrobe and was murdered? How had the village flooded overnight when the water level in the reservoir had been mysteriously sinking all series? And if it was semi-biblical, why did parish priest Father Jean-Francois not see it coming? And can we see the Lek pub from here? I know how telly works. Nobody wants one series of anything. If it's a hit, only a fool or someone with principles would end it. Thus, the return has become, in TV parlance, a returning series. It giveth and it holdeth back. Here's the €64,000 question. Is there a more French man on earth than Claire's estranged husband, Jérôme, played to Gallic perfection by Frédéric Piero? It's the only answer to all those questions. Now, according to TV scheduling orthodoxy, August is the cruelest month, as everybody's on holiday. But there's a recession on. Nobody's on holiday. And Channel 4 have made the month their own, with the rum run, the great dates, and now the skill mill. That's one for your bastard. Thanks, Mrs. T. Written by former Coronation Street regular John Fay and directed by returning series all-rounder James Hawes, The Mill might be a glimpse into the utopian Zero Hours future vision of George Osborne. <laughs> Based, as it clearly states, on the people and history of Quarry Bank Mill, Cheshire, where the sympathetically dramatised four-parter is shot for maximum folk museum authenticity, The Mill highlights the mid-19th century growing pains of industrial evolution. Day-to-day -day life for the expendable orphans and workhouse apprentices this socially responsible series focuses on was essentially like working at Amazon without the GPS tracking system to time how long you take in the privy. Not that you want to go anywhere near the smallest room with an overlooker like Craig Parkinson about. I'll tell. Let me in. You look at me. I've been a fan of Parkinson's work since his alternative Tony Wilson in Control and a campaign for him to play Bradley Wiggins should BBC4 ever come into an inheritance. But he excels as duplicitous schemers and The Mill provides him with one of his best. He's also typical of the kind of robust casting that isn't starry-eyed. Actors whose name you have to look up. Such as, I looked them up, Donald Sumpter and Barbara Martin as the mill owners, proving that it's grim up Cheshire even for the 1%. First class infotainment. If you're looking for trouble at mill, you've come to the right place. Now, before we steal ourselves for Southcliffe, which joins the mill on Sunday evenings for an ad hoc Channel 4 comedy night, let's lighten the load with a cop caper that's back on BBC One for its 10th series, which is my signal to watch my first ever episode. It's all right, it's okay, doesn't really matter if you're old and grey. What jaunty fun! It's Dennis Waterman singing the theme tune amid a merry band of over 60s, and in the token woman's case, over 50, solving old cases and making that ah sound when they sit down or get up. It's all right, I say it's okay, we're getting to the end of the day. What do I know about new tricks? Well, it's popular, pulling in upwards of 8 million viewers, it's a sort of crime-fighting last of the summer wine, and there was some argy-bargy when the grumpy old cast undiplomatically mithered in an interview about the quality of the scripts, at which point I militantly took the side of the writers. Oh, and it's jaunty. When you look into the abyss, the abyss also looks into you. 
wait a minute, where's the jaunt? I mean, that's already good writing, but new tricks. I think I've been sold an old pup. What have I got? Arthritis. A son who wishes I didn't exist. And a name that'll never be clear. Cheer up, Alan Armstrong's recovering alcoholic. You're leaving UCOS, the unemployed codgers and oldie squad, this series to join fellow retiree James Bolam. His place will be filled by sitcom's Nicholas Lindhurst, who's barely out of his 40s, while Bolam has turned into silver star Wolf fox Dennis Lawson. Thank God Waterman's still hanging in there. What's that? Oh. This is the latest thing in smoking cessation technology. The electric fag. Very high tech. Despite the hasty generational cleansing of the principal cast, at a time when Last Tango in Halifax and Love and Marriage have shown that the over 50s do watch TV, I must admit, as a latecomer, I found this first case surprisingly entertaining. As a new series treat, the not that wrinklies were sent on holiday to Gibraltar for a tourist board two-parter. Neanderthal man ended his days out here after facing social rejection from the early Spanish. It's a duty-free paradise, this place, you know. Cheapest bags in the world, by the way. With a plot linking a gun in the Thames with a dead playboy and the Falklands, this was wittily written and keenly plotted by new boy Simon Allen. Oh, come on, Governor. I mean, when you're on holiday in a new place... We're not on holiday. Well, we're sort of are, aren't we? We're on an investigation! Obviously, I have no way of comparing it to previous series, but it felt fresh and funny and sad and gritty at the same time, so maybe it was Bolam that was making it stale, in his own words, and not the writers. Talking of new tricks, here's a show that's smart enough not to try and learn any. You knew you wanted to use the shell. Once you've decided to make crab cakes, there really is no use for the shell, but you wanted to use it, so you've put a spinach salad in it. Yeah, think, are you complaining or stating? I think the only reason to use the shell is to serve crab meat in it, not to serve a salad in it. Well, we'll have to agree to differ on that, Craig. Well, that's where then I'm really pleased that I make the decision whether you advance <laughs> or not, and not you. <laughs> A pathological weakness of mine, Celebrity MasterChef returned to BBC One for its eighth series, and there's not much to say, other than contestant Janet Street Porter trod a very fine line between giving the industrial format a welcome dig in the spare ribs and upsetting the entire apple cart with her boil-in-a-bag belligerence. I can't see what's wrong with the way I've served it. You're trying to make me serve it like I'm in a restaurant, and I categorically can't do that. I'm serving it like you'd have it at home, right? So, yeah, they've done it more like you because they've crawled up to you and they've done it with all that <laughs> thing. Well, oh, and if ever Greg Wallace wished he hadn't stuttered over the word your, it was in this assessment of comedian Katie Brand's Lemon Flan. I find it quite pleasant. Left to my own devices, I'd, I'd probably munch the living daylights out of your, your little tart. Very, very nice. Excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> Palette cleansed. Happy days. Southcliff, Channel 4's harrowing four part go at a small community rent asunder by tragedy, will be thought of as post Broadchurch, even though it was in production before ITV's Who Done It aired. Unlikely to send second homeowners scurrying to Faversham in Kent, where it's filmed, Southcliff, written by Red Riding's incredible Tony Grisoni, is not so much a Who Done It as a Where Done It, as interested in the psychology of the town as it is about its Hungerford, Dunblane, Cumbria style shooting spree. It opens as minimally but heartrendingly as this, the early morning piece of much reloading in the marsh, shattered by a lone gunman's apparent act of revenge on the vicinity around him. It could be anywhere. Yes, it was harrowing. Yes, it resonated with news reports we all remember watching, slack-jawed. And yes, Sean Harris was his usual terrifying self as the ex-army outsider with a sick mum and a doomed dog. Mm. I um, need to speak to you. But look at how beautifully it's framed. And lit, or lit to look like it's not lit. This is tragedy as art. And yet another example of a movie director, Sean Durkin, lured to TV and across the pond. Canadian born, London raised and New York film schooled, if you saw Durkin's feature debut, US indie hit Martha Marcy May Marlene last year, you'll know he has a subtle touch with minefield material. He's also unafraid to point his camera at a wall while something vital is happening in another room. They throw laurels at this sort of thing up at Sundance, so it's interesting that Durkin would put all that behind him to make something for our Sunday night telly, where even a sophisticated Channel 4 audience is unused to watching paint that's already dried. I haven't seen part two yet, but as someone who also writes about films, I'm feeling a bit spoiled by telly currently. 
which provides your moment of zen, the priceless reaction of Dennis Waterman to some stock footage of a monkey. Yeah, that's it.